I was so confused. I remember like, God, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if I should believe this book. I don't know if you can be trusted. This is the book and the foundation that my whole life is built on. Can I really trust it? Well, this is a little story all about how my life got twisted, turned upside down. My professor said, I'm gonna change everything you thought you knew about Jesus. And that was the first clue and the first indicator that this was not gonna be the easy A that I anticipated. As I got immersed in apologetics, I didn't see anyone like me. And I thought, man, it would be great to have this material contextualized for my people. I founded Jew3 Project to help people know what they believe and why because I know what it feels like to question your faith and feel like you don't know where to turn. See, I believe a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Deconstruction is a part of you really being able to understand your faith. And that's the theme of this year's conference, Courageous Conversations 2023, Renewed Faith, moving from deconstruction to reconstruction. I challenge you to meet us in Washington, D.C., August 31st to September 2nd. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. All right, all right, good evening. All right, so let's get this out of the way first. So we made it through lunch. We made it through dinner. If you're anything like me, you might be battling the itis right now, but that's okay. I'm going to ask you, the same question that Jesus asked his disciples at the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you tarry with me one more hour? One more hour. <laughs> All right, but no, good to, good to see everyone back here. You know, in, in 1915, uh, on Thanksgiving of 1915, at Stone Mountain Park in Georgia, uh, there was a, uh, a rally uh, held, and it was by a Methodist preacher. Let me repeat that, a Methodist preacher uh, named William Joseph Simmons, and he inaugurated what we, there were se several iterations, but the, the modern day version of the Ku Klux Klan. And this Methodist preacher did that with a group of, uh, a group of white uh, men around him, a burning cross on one side, and a Bible open to Romans chapter 12 on the other. And I give you this example because this is just one example in the history of America of how this peculiar relationship of how uh, um, white supremacy and Christianity have become intertwined. And so that's what we're discussing today. And I hope that most, if not all of you, have got a chance to watch the unspoken document, uh, documentary. Um, yes. Dr. Bantu was a part of that. We've had some other panelists a part of that as well. But that, this question of is Christianity the white man's religion is, is the central thesis of that documentary. So let's start at the, at the very beginning. I'll present this question first. What is the origin of this question, is Christianity the white man's religion? Or let me put it like this, or rather, what set of circumstances contributed to Christianity being associated with people of European descent? We'll start with Lisa and come around uh, this way. So uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Vince Bantu, uh, talked about this last year, but Constantine and Christianity being the re official religion of Rome kind of made Christian this concept, synonymous with this concept of whiteness. And I can't explain it as eloquently as Dr. Bantu, but I think that's one aspect. But I think in America, obviously, pictures of white Jesus, uh, when we do the uh, Is Christianity a White Man's Religion on HBCUs, we always play viral videos that connect with the audience. And one uh, video that we play is Muhammad Ali doing an interview. And he's talking about when we get to heaven, are we going to be the, the servants in heaven? Um, because he equated uh, Christianity with whiteness and in a tool of oppression. And as we see in slavery, using scriptures to justify slavery. So I think obviously going back, if you wanna go back to Constantine, but I think also in America, white Jesus, slave owners using scripture to oppress, um, further this narrative that Christianity is a white man's religion. Bishop Omar. Um, I think, um, let me come at it another way. He, he who tells the story 
owns the story. So I think let's, let's start at who owned and who told the story. Um, they told the story f from their perspective and selectively edited it. Um, very meticulously, they um, left out revelations in the very Bible that they said they used. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm 74 years old, so no, don't let this black hair fool you. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, and um, I was 30 years old, grew up in a black church with the white mosaics of pictures of Jesus. I was 30 years old before anyone told me that there were black people in the Bible. And I had always sat under not only black preachers, but black educated preachers who never told me um, because they passed on the story as they had heard it. And frighteningly so, many of them had even gone to schools of color. And so they, they modeled for us what to put in and what to leave out. So in the sense of them telling the story, I think they're, they're, they did own it. You know, how, how can you go? A couple of, weeks, couple of years ago, my wife and I went to Fiji, to a mountain village, 230-some people, uh, down a river, up in the mountains. They lived in the mountains, the whole village. And they came down to meet us, and we, they es escorted us back to the top of this hill. We go to this village, and 200-some people, in the middle of the village was a, a church, and when you walk into that church, the first thing you see in this village of chocolate people was a vanilla Jesus. Because he who tells the story owns the story. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Waters. Sure. First, I want to thank you for the privilege of being here and uh, engaging in this dialogue. Uh, I know Dr. Antipas Harris has a book of this title and has done research here. But I also found very helpful uh, an article in the Gospel Coalition by Claude Otko, where he answers a question by addressing three primary reasons why Christianity can be perceived or is perceived by some as a white person's religion. Uh, one is the history of oppression uh, present in, in the religion. Uh, the second is the whitewashing of Jesus. And the third is what he calls apathy in the church towards racial justice. To your point, I brought some things I would like to share very briefly. I collect artifacts from our nation's history, and you summarize it well. It was in November of 1915 where William Joseph Simmons climbed atop Stone Mountain, Georgia, with those men and built an altar, right, and said he heard the angels of heaven rejoicing uh, as they built that altar to erect uh, the second generation of the Ku Klux Klan. This is an authentic Ku Klux Klan hood from that second rise. But when you investigate, when you investigate uh, their wares, this is the robe. What do you see prominently displayed? The cross. It's central. Now, interestingly enough, that red drop of blood in the middle of the cross uh, is not the blood of Jesus, but it's the blood of the white man and the blood that they perceive that they have shed. Uh, in order to create this nation. That's just one aspect. I just got back from Charleston, South Carolina. I'm an Emerson Collective Fellow, and I'm researching a gentleman by the name of W.W. W. Wilbur, who was a slave seller in Charleston, South Carolina. For those who don't know, Charleston, South Carolina, as a port, was responsible for 40 to 50 percent of all black people entering this country in chains. These are uh, the literal change, you saw them featured uh, in the documentary that appeared beforehand. These are the literal chains of W.W. Wilbur. If you read them, it says W.W. Wilbur, slave seller on one side, 1806. On the other side, it says strong, healthy African Negroes, lot number 32. The reason this is important is because in 1845, W.W. W. Wilbur is a part of a conversation 
with slave sellers from across the state of South Carolina in terms of how they would use Christianity amongst the enslaved. They're establishing the rules of order for what is appropriate in teaching slaves about Jesus. And in those minutes, they make it very clear that you should not say anything or allow any reading that will inspire liberation. As a matter of fact, a white person must be present to prove all that is shared in that space. One final thing I want to share with you here, because I think this is important. This is an authentic lynching postcard. If you look on the face of this, you see the depiction of a black man hanging by his neck. These were popularized during the 20th century. Mass-produced images of black death. The importance of this postcard is when we know when did most public lynchings happen. Most public lynchings happen on Sunday. So white worshipers left worship to kill black people. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a, there's a film called uh, The Same, came out in uh, 2019, and they ask a gentleman from the South in that film if he knows of any of his white neighbors who still have the body parts of lynching victims preserved in their homes. This is in 2019. And he refuses to answer the question as to not incriminate his neighbors. That, that's, that's the history of oppression. When, when you move beyond the history of oppression, right, to the whitewashing of Jesus, we have to talk about an aspect of our history which is understudied, which is the Naturalization Act of 1790, where America literally says that whiteness is a prerequisite to citizenship. So when people say this is a white person's country, historically they're not wrong. It's not until 1868 with the 14th Amendment that black people are brought into the conversation, 1924 that indigenous people are brought into the conversation, 1954 that Asian American people are brought into the conversation for citizenship. But the reason that's important in 1790 is up to that time, Puritan understandings of depictions of the divine permeate America, meaning that you don't have any artistic depictions of Christ. But around the time of this Naturalization Act, you all of a sudden see the emergence of the white Jesus. The white Jesus is to give endorsement to citizenship, basically creating God in your own image and determining who could be welcome to the American enterprise. And then finally, we talk about apathy. I don't know that there's any more racist organization in the world than white Christian evangelicalism. I don't know if there's any more racist institution uh, because the persons who worship there then go out to enact harms in our legislatures, in the mass uh, incarceration in our country, and in so many other spaces. And so if you're looking for an image of Christ that is welcoming and embracing of all, but that is the image that you see, ultimately you see a white supremacist God. Dr. Bantu. Yeah, I would just echo a lot of what's been said. Um, that I think that absolutely, uh, I think that we see the origins of a white supremacist Christianity in the fourth century uh, during Constantine's time. I think it's important to point out that, you know, the fourth century wasn't the beginning of white Christianity, uh, but it was the origin of white supremacist Christianity because, uh, you know I, know, I know we'll get in more into this, but, but the gospel is for all people and that includes white people and all people are made in God's image and that includes white people. And so we see the gospel going into the Gentiles and Paul goes on missionary journeys to Rome and John finds Gentile Greek ways to communicate the Hebrew Palestinian gospel into a Greek Gentile Roman uh, milieu and context. So, so uh, we already have, and then in the first and second and third centuries, you have other theologians like Justin Martyr and and uh, and Clement of Rome and and uh, and Clement of Alexandria that are articulating Christian Christianity in kind of a Greco-Roman kind of way, as well as Christianity was going in every other direction. It was there were just as many Christians in the Persian Empire uh, already in the first few centuries. In fact, in the second and third century. It was actually in the, you know, kind of the, the foundation of what would later be known as the white world or the Western world, the Roman Empire. That was actually the most hostile place for Christians to be. And, uh, and actually in places like Iran and Iraq and Pakistan that we call today, that was actually places where Christians were thriving. And in India, Christians were going on the Nile Valley in Ethiopia and Nubia and Egypt. Christians were everywhere of every color and they were all over the place and they weren't associated.
associated with any one particular culture. Uh, but in the fourth century, when Constantine, uh, you know, allegedly converted to Christianity, and we could get into that, uh, then all of a sudden Christianity became seen as a, a Roman religion. There was a there was a religious nationalism where Christianity was linked with the political and militaristic and economic agenda of the Roman Empire. And basically, ever since then, you've had Western superpowers doing the same thing. You had Charlemagne in the ninth century calling himself a new Constantine. Then you had crusading European nations going into, uh, into the Middle East to claim this nation, seeing themselves as Christ's representative on earth. So this isn't something that starts in the 1400s because they also have ideas about them being a superior race. And you already have the idea of black people being the cursed sons of Ham uh, that were meant to be slaves. This is already in the fifth and sixth century. This is long before uh, Europeans got into boats and came into Africa and just as, you know, uh, Christ, uh, uh, I don't want to call it Christianity, but a, a, a cult or a perverted expression of Christianity was linked with the slave castles where people were rounding up Africans and then worshiping Jesus uh, or their, their image of their idol of a Jesus uh, while they were uh, making cathedrals or chapels on top of dungeons where Africans were herded even worse than you would do cattle or animals. And so uh, that same slavery dynamic was really built off of the crusading mentality of trying to be this Western Christian superpower that would be a kind of a check to the Islamic powers in the East. And then that spreads into the North, into the Americas, and you have the genocide of indigenous peoples and boarding schools and the linking of Christianity with whiteness. And so you have the idea of we need to kill the Indian and save the man. And the same, you know, kind of perverted Christianity that led into slavery. And I think that leads us into today where we might be dealing with maybe one of the most difficult expressions of white supremacist Christianity in that it often is so masked and ambiguous and disguised where white supremacy and Christianity continue or again a, a perverted form of Christianity continue to persist we saw that on full display down the street just a couple of years ago but it, it you know uh, I think actually uh, I might uh, I might even go so far as to say that this kind of white supremacist Christianity the extremely blatant form might not be in 2022 uh, the, the the thing we have to deal with as much as 1915 for example but oftentimes it's it's people who benefit off of the oppression that their fathers and grandfathers wreaked upon our ancestors and are living in that privilege, but then just saying, well, you know, color doesn't matter. And uh, oftentimes, you know, white people are not aware of their own culture and how their culture inflex, uh, affects their theology. And also uh, we have the kind of to combine that with the reality of oftentimes uh, people are having a theology that says that color doesn't matter. Uh, and that, and so people are still, but people of color are still dealing with centuries of oppression and trauma. And if, if, if my father robbed somebody else's father and stole their property and stole their wealth, then my children would grow up with certain privileges. And then, and then it would be inappropriate to say to the child of that parent, uh, that family, well, you know, you have just as much of a chance and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But people are dealing with centuries of oppression that were wrought by Christianity. And I think the challenge we deal with today is so often it's not said, but the reality is still the majority of the most prominent seminaries, Christian colleges, denominations, Christian organizations are run by white men. And even in institutions of theological education, the majority of the reading lists recommended and required are written by white men. And when you try to push or challenge this, then oftentimes, and I deal with this uh, even today in 2022, I dealt with it as a student and I'm dealing with it as a professor, that things that have to do with black or indigenous or non-white people are relegated as a niche thing or that's, an, that's a side thing, or we need to get to the core theology, the core church history, the core biblical studies, and then we can get to the other stuff of color. But you see right in there the duality and complexity of how white supremacy works today, where whiteness is both denied and yet it still persists in dominance at the same time. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah. And if, if y'all losing count, that was just one question. So... Um, so, <laughs> Dr. Bantu, I want to stay with you for a second. Um, you know, you talked a lot about, you gave a lot of great information about the, the context, the greater context, historical and, and, and all that. Why is, um, why is this question of is Christianity the white man's religion always posed, all, why is it always associated with Christianity? I mean, we have all these other religions, right? 
Islam, we have the, the Eastern religions, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism and, and you know, all these, all these other religions. Why don't we say is Christianity or, is, excuse me, is Islam the white man's religion? Is Buddhism the white man's religion? Why is it uniquely always associated with Christianity? And we'll go around. Yeah, I think that it has to do with the fact that, that it was primarily white people who decided to pick Christianity as their puppet religion that they would use to really mask their own uh, pol political and colonial goals and just slap Christianity on. It could have been Islam, it could have been Buddhism, it could have been any other religion, and, uh, and then you know people would have a similar reaction, but it happened to be Christianity, which as I, I mentioned a moment ago, was the religion that their ancestors in the Roman Empire were persecuting and were very much against, saw that Greco-Roman identity as opposed to Christianity, but then in the fourth century became fused with it, and now we've dealt with 1,700 years of white supremacist Western Eurocentric Christendom, I say, rather than Christianity, uh, and I think that that's why we've seen that. We and and I think that it's um, this 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 dynamic that we're dealing with. Um, you know, I truly believe that the perception that Christianity is not a white man's religion. It's not any one person's religion because. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people. It's for every nation, tribe, and tongue with nobody having a prized seat in the church or around the throne of God, but everyone has an equal access to Jesus and that all of us bring all of who we are into the gospel. Um, and that was, that, was exact, that was from the beginning of, of the gospel, the proto-evangelion, that, that God told Abraham that through his seed, all nations will be blessed. God is consistently telling the Hebrew people that, you know, I don't love you more than anybody else. Isn't Cush to me like Zion? And uh, and it's too small a thing for you to be my servant. I'll make you a light unto the Gentiles. And so that comes to fruition with Jesus. And in Acts 2, you see a multicultural uh, gathering at Pentecost, every nation, tribe, and tongue. And the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation is consistently focused on the issue of helping Jewish believers understand that this is not just for you. And actually, Gentiles are getting saved, too. They're filled with the Holy Spirit even before you arrive on the scene. And they are embraced and a part of the covenant people of God just as much as you are. And on top of that, they don't have to assimilate and become Jewish. They're not going to. Now, that doesn't mean Acts 21. That doesn't mean that you have to stop being Jewish. That's what John. Uh, that's what, uh, you know, uh, 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 James and, and Paul had to work out. That doesn't mean that Jewish believers stop being Jewish. No, you still be Jewish. But a Greek Christian is going to be a Greek and an Ethiopian Christian is going to be Ethiopian. So this is God's covenant plan. And I love the providential uh, just wisdom of God that God chose to use maybe one of the most dispersed people groups in the ancient world, the Hebrews. They were literally everywhere. They were centered in the middle of the known world in Israel, a place that touches Africa, is in Asia, and touches Europe, right there in the middle of the world. And they were in India. They were in Central Asia, even in China. They, there were Hebrews in Nubia, in Europe. They were everywhere. So the Hebrew people like today could literally look like almost the entire race. And God spread the gospel in every direction, through first through Hebrew Christians of every culture, and then to non-Hebrew. And that was God's plan for the gospel to spread. And I truly believe that the the satanic intervention of white supremacy lay, attempting to lay hold of the Christian gospel and say, we are the masters of this religion. We are its true arbiters. We are its true representatives on earth. We know God better than everyone else. That, that, is, that has been and still is the single greatest obstacle to the spread of the gospel in the world today. Because most people in the world are not white. And most people in the world who are not Christian and not white the number one reason you can go anywhere in the world and you talk to someone who is not white, which is the majority of the world, and if you talk to someone who's not a Christian, hands down, the number one reason, it's not going to be, I don't believe in God. It's not going to be, I don't believe G uh, miracles uh, really can happen. It's not going to be things like that. Most people in the world believe in God, believe in the miraculous. It's going to be because Christianity is associated with whiteness and it's antithetical to my people. And in fact, Christianity by white people has done harm through colonialism and slavery in my people. Therefore, it's a non-starter from the get-go. And that's I think that's exactly uh, the way in which it's been associated with Western identity and whiteness for 1,700 years that it has been this huge detriment to the spread of the gospel. That's powerful. Absolutely. Yes. Go back to the Enlightenment period. Yes. When you look at the Benin Empire, modern-day Nigeria, and you're looking at the Portuguese, they had a trade route between those two nations. They saw one another as equals, okay? 
And then that relationship dynamic shifts and the Portuguese return. They return as enslavers to capture black life and to place it in chains. The reason that's important is because there was a worldview and there was a time void of these notions of race. So how does race emerge as a social construct during the Enlightenment period? Well, it does so to benefit and create profits off of the bodies of black people and to get pleasure, frankly, from their bodies as well. I think that's a very important aspect of that history, okay? So before we even move into white supremacy in terms of Christianity, before we even move to the pseudoscience of the day that tried to dehumanize black life and connect it more with animals, right? You have this system that is created through enslavement to build, proper, to build profits for the monarchs and the aristocrats of Europe, okay? It's about power, power to gain wealth off of the backs of others. We don't necessarily see other faith traditions historically moving in that way. And so at least from the Enlightenment period forward, every time we see a period of colonialism, genocide against a whole nation of people that is driven by a Western European or American power is done so oftentimes couched through faith. And because we don't see that manifested with many other religions, I think that's why in most cases you see this connection with Christianity. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, there's two things which kind of combine what my colleagues have said. Th there's a his why the question keeps arising. Um, there's a historical reality of Christianity being woven in the fabric of our history of this nation. Um, I think secondly, there's the inconsistency of the, uh, the proclamation of this nation, land of the free and home of the brave, and we say that's, but we say that's different um, from what you've shown us. So I think it arises from a very historical place of that ain't the way it was, or that's the way it has been. We have been, the history has been woven with the thread of Christianity uh, that legitimized uh, how history developed, and then to arrive at a place where we are the land of the free and the home of the brave, uh, and we deny that all around us. I, I, think, I think a black Christian is possibly one of the greatest miracles of God. That, that a people would look beyond the oppressor and see the omnipotent savior um, and the very uh, weapon that was used to oppress us becomes a weapon of deliverance for he who hath eyes to see and heart to believe and ears to hear. That's powerful. Amen. Amen. Lisa. I think we need to interrogate how we let white supremacists hijack Christianity. Because they couldn't use authentic Christianity and the scripture as is, they only took pieces of it. They took it out of context. And it is, and any truth taken out of context usually becomes a lie. That's what Satan has done from the beginning. Did God really say? He's trying to, in the garden, tempt Jesus with pieces of truth. And white supremacists do what their father has taught them to do. Take pieces of the truth to oppress people. And he's confused people so much that they'll reject the tool that liberates them, scripture, because they think it's fully oppressive. And so when we're on the HBCU tour, I always tell students, one of the greatest ways to fight white supremacy is to read scripture from cover to cover. Because they never wanted us to read it to begin with. So if I reject it, I'm really doing what white supremacists wanted me to do all along. 
So I think I want to interrogate this idea that Christianity as we know it in America is Christianity. I would only label it as a counterfeit. And we are so familiar with counterfeits that we cannot recognize authenticity. And so I always like to use the, this, uh, the idea of when we think about understanding authentic money. When they train somebody in the treasury, they train them with authentic bills. They let them touch them, smell them, and then they'll throw a counterfeit in there. Unfortunately, the only thing we've touched, smelled, and dealt with is the counterfeit. And so unfortunately, we have no identity with the truth. And then when truth comes, we reject it because we're just familiar with the counterfeit. Wow. wow. That's powerful, Lisa. You know, the, the philosopher uh, Esther Meek talked about uh, the acquisition of knowledge, and she talked about that the acquisition of knowledge shouldn't just be for information's sake, but it should be for transformation. And so what I want to do is ask a couple of questions that have to do with not only our transformation individually, but also how just some practical ways of dealing with this issue, because I'm sure if we took a poll, many of you have had to not only battle with this question internally yourselves, but you've, had, you've gotten questions from others as well. So I want to start with you, uh, Bishop, Bishop Omar, and maybe we can go around and just give one tip on how would you address this question within the context of the conscious community? Because oftentimes, the black conscious community, because oftentimes this question will come up within you know, black Hebrew uh, Israelism or the nation of Islam as a reason why we should reject Christianity. So what's one tip that you would give for addressing this issue within the context of these black uh, conscious com uh, community issues? I, I think there is a challenge of, um, uh, from Jesus on the cross. Um, I think at some point we must recognize that progress, advancement for us will include what Jesus said Forgive them, for they don't know what the hell, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Lisa, we'll go to you. The question is how how do we res respond? Yeah, what's um, what's one tip? What's one tip that you would give for to help? people with addressing this question within the, conscious, within the context of black uh, conscious. Yeah, so I always share this story when I think about people in the conscious community, Hebrew Israelites, when we were on at HBCUs who were at Southern University. And Hebrew Israelites follow us everywhere. Uh, they must be, they keep a calendar, they show up. And these two gentlemen, they were Hebrew Israelites, showed up for Q&A. And at first, they were doing their thing, just being kind of rude. But then one left, and then one almost broke down, with almost tears in his eyes. Vince was there. And he said, why are my people suffering like this? It must be that we're cursed. And so I always tell that story because that was the moment they moved from agitators where I really started to empathize with them, to see this is just a young brother who's trying to make sense of the problem of evil. And so I think at the, at the core of people who are going to these movements, is real pain. And so I think we need to listen for what I call the pain point to see that they're probably looking for personhood, they're probably looking for peace, protection, provision, um, something in there. And once you get to their pain point and listen, then you can minister to that. Amen. Amen. Dr. Bantu, and then we'll come over to Dr. Waters. Yeah, I agree with with all of that. I, you know, I've always um, and if I could even expand it just a little bit, even beyond the conscious community. But I think that you know, I I, I just you know, I think that there is a lot of commonality with all of these 
like black new religious movements, whether it's the conscious comedic community, black Hebrew Israelites, uh, you know, black folks going into like spirit, African spirituality, like West African, the Orishas and all of that, or, um, you know, bl black Muslims, five percenters, like there's all these different groups. Um, and they're very different. <laughs> they have like conflicting religious claims and views and they don't like each other. <laughs> uh, but the one thing they do have in common is that they all don't like Christianity. Uh, and precisely because they perceive it as the white man's religion. Um, and, uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, just kind of piggybacking off of what's been said, the, I think there's two real pains and two common things that I see in all of these communities, um, you know, be, uh, because again, as I engage them, they oftentimes seem more interested in like bashing and deconstructing Christianity than actually promoting their own theology, if they're even aware of it in terms of like original languages or texts or anything. Um, and so I think the two things that come, that the bashing comes out of, the two areas of pain that the bashing comes out of is, one is I think there's a thirst for justice, uh, that, there, that there are injustices that have been being, have been wrought and are being wrought upon our community that, that honestly a lot of times um, people in some of these religious communities are sometimes more, at least rhetorically or verbally, are more apt and prone to just decry uh, than sometimes the black churches. Uh, and I think that, that we as even the black church have to do some repentance. And that I think that we have to really come to terms with how we have let some of the most marginalized economically, uh, just in so many other you know, aspects of our community have, uh, have you know, especially in the last 50 years, have sometimes allowed our desire for progress and, and platform and, and networks and relationships with uh, politicians, with various sectors of power that we have sometimes not stood in the gap as much as we should have. And that's, it's actually in the margins, in the prisons, in the projects where these religions are growing most rapidly because they often feel that the black church is not a representative for them. Now I say that understanding that still the black church has been and still is the central community and institution in the black community in this country and, and has done more for our people than all of these other religions I'm naming combined. Uh, when you're talking about schools and nonprofits and, and social work and, and helping people with light bills and all of that. But I think that there's a, 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 a rhetoric of justice and a fiery prophetic preaching that's needed that when a, a young person is killed by police or when we're talking about gentrification or when we're talking about these justice issues that are we preaching about it from the pulpit in that prophetic kind of way and uh, and are we actually speaking to the valid cries for justice that are coming from our community and then the second thing I think that uh, is, is, is driving at a lot of these different communities is a search for their African their black identity cultural identity to be affirmed. That to know that to be, it, it, and again, I think this is where we need to repent. Uh, certainly white supremacist Christianity is primarily to blame for this, but I think even in the black church that we in many ways, and I, th I, see, I think this is a global uh, epidemic, and going back to the comment I made about the issue of this being a, a gospel, this is an evangelistic issue around the world. I was talking about how people around the world see Christianity as a white man's religion. It's not true, it isn't, but they have very understandable reasons for thinking that, because white Christianity is the most practiced form of Christianity in the world. You can go anywhere in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, even in communities of color here, and you'll see white Jesuses. You'll hear white Christian music. You'll see bookstores and churches, and it's mostly white Christian authors translating their language. You go to Bible colleges and seminaries overseas, and it's mainly white faculty or people reading and being inundated with white theology. It's like theological McDonald's or Walmart being exported, American culture being globalized throughout the rest of the world. And so I understand why people see that, because non-Christians in those contexts, they see their own people who look like them becoming a Christian and the next thing you know they start acting really white and start acting really western and they, they think that to become a Christian means I have to check my identity at the door and I cannot be fully who I am and the good news in Jesus Christ is that both of those yearnings are deeply valid, they are deeply biblical, and the gospel speaks to justice because God is the author of justice and also God made black Black is beautiful. The Bible says it. Song of Songs 1 and 5. And so African identity and all cultural identities are affirmed in Scripture. Um, so, yeah, that's what I was saying. Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> With a lot of agreement with what has been said. I think there is a level of humility and empathy we must have for the community because that pain comes from a very real place. 
kind of moving back across generations, but what comes to the top of mind now is Malcolm X, whose father was a Christian minister who was lynched in Wichita, Kansas by other purported Christians. And when Christians are murdering your father, when they're placing dynamite on the eastern wall of your church and blowing four girls into eternity before worship, when they're lynching your people, when they are building prisons where they should be building schools, and you have what James Baldwin talks about, the catalog of horrors, then it's clear to understand why there's some persons who would not embrace a Christ who appears to be murdering their people. On the other side of that, uh, there's a book that my father wrote. He just retired uh, after years as a New Testament professor, but he wrote a book called Afrocentric Sermons, The Beauty of Blackness in the Bible. His name is Kenneth Waters. Uh, the foreword was written by Kane Hopefelder, the great Kane Hopefelder, uh, who per was professor for years here at Howard Divinity. I have personally found it helpful to share that book with people who have the question. Because what I've often come to discover is that the people who are within these traditions, who are speaking out against Christianity as a white man's religion, have actually bought into the notion of white supremacy and are in fact rejecting their heritage. Because they consider themselves learned and intellectual and the desire to know more information, I simply say check this book out and consider the active presence of Christianity in Africa for years prior to its arrival in Europe and then ask the question, is this a white man's religion? When you investigate the presence of so many black people, so many African nations in the scriptures, when you recognize the presence of the Ethiopian church, when you recognize, as Henry Louis Gates shares with us, uh, that Christianity was in the Congo before the enslavers arrived, why would you be willing to give away the birthright of your Christianity? If Christianity is anything, it's black. If it's anything, it's African. If we want to invite James Cone into the conversation, it's so black that God is black because God identifies with the oppressed. And if this is a text that moves with oppressed communities who are seeking liberation, what can be blacker than Christianity? I think... Uh there, there's a generational dynamic here that um, kind of goes back to something that Dr. Bantu said, and that is, well, while we're repenting, while we're at it, repenting, I think that there's, a, there's room for uh, my generation um, repenting, intentionally repenting. I think there are those who are waiting for us to repent that either we knew better and didn't say it, or we didn't want to know better. And that maybe there were rooms and uh, affirmations that we wanted so badly. And spaces that we wanted to be in so badly. That we either acted like we didn't see it or we didn't ask enough questions. And there's a generation now who's saying, what's up with that? Yeah. Because there's an implication that our silence, um, that there are silence uh, validates and, and okays the history that has led to this quite Christianity fallacy. Um, for that, somebody needs to repent. We've done the same thing to Christianity in America as we've done to Dr. King. We sanitized it. Yeah. Yeah, man. We removed it of its revolutionary spirit. Uh, we've domesticated it. Uh, we have made Jesus to be weak yeah. instead of one who turns over tables and challenges systems. And I also think for communities that are looking for a liberator, they don't find that in the Jesus that most churches present. And so if we present an authentic Christ that 
meets with the quote-unquote notorious sinners, who finds himself in the company of the marginalized, and who challenges power for the liberation of all, that's a Christ that they can believe in. I believe there's an earnest yearning for liberation. I do agree uh, that what has been exported is this uh, white supremacist notion of Christ, even if it's done so in a packaging uh, that is uh, not initially offensive, but it doesn't suit well a people who need to be liberated. And we need to be liberated. Let's be, let's be honest. Uh, this year alone, and this is very important, in 2022, wealth disparity between white people and black people has never been greater than the time of slavery. And as we are sitting having this conversation now, the very conversation of democracy is in peril. And people are not looking for a Christ that's simply going to pat you on the back and simply tell you to get along with others. They want a Christ that's going to challenge the system for the liberation of themselves and their children. And I think that's the opportunity that we have where we introduce them to a Christ who was a refugee who fled for his safety into a black community so that he can then liberate us as a grown man. But m many of us exegetes have skipped those passages. We, we've skipped over those. Uh, the, the turning out of the temple, um, the challenges of injustice, um, the, the, the affinity toward the oppressed. Um, and many times I fear we've done it um, because that's all we've gotten to get the letters behind our name. Other times I fear we've just not asked enough questions. I was so confused. I remember, like, God, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if I should believe this book. I don't know if you can be trusted. This is the book and the foundation that my whole life is built on. Can I really trust it? Well, this is a little story all about how my life got twist, turned upside down. My professor said, I'm gonna change everything you thought you knew about Jesus. And that was the first clue and the first indicator that this was not gonna be the easy A that I anticipated. As I got immersed in apologetics, I didn't see anyone like me. And I thought, man, it would be great to have this material contextualized for my people. I founded Jew3 Project to help people know what they believe and why because I know what it feels like to question your faith and feel like you don't know where to turn. See, I believe a faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. Deconstruction is a part of you really being able to understand your faith. And that's the theme of this year's conference, Courageous Conversations 2023, Renewed Faith, moving from deconstruction to reconstruction. I challenge you to meet us in Washington, D.C., August 31st to September 2nd. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. So in just a moment here, we're about to enter into Q&A, so I just want to remind you, we got a lot of questions that's coming in already, but please go ahead and submit any questions that you have in pigeonhole. If you see something that you want to hear an answer to, go ahead and um, you can upvote it. And um, okay, we're going to start with uh, this one here, who has uh, just about the, the the most votes. To what extent, if any, should Black Christians embrace uh, Jewish heritage and identity? I think that um, it is to the extent that we follow the biblical record, that we follow the. Uh, the spread of the gospel, the spread of the church that uh, I think what Dr. Bantu said, the gospel is for all. And the challenges that the gospel had and that the gospelers had in taking that, uh, that gospel across boundaries and, and across racial lines, et cetera, you know, I think that is the degree to which we must do that. We must um, connect with the, 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 the chasms that the gospel brought together and crossed. Uh, and if we do that, bibli biblically, I don't think we can ignore the Jewish tradition. I think we just can't leave it there. Yeah. I think one of the things is, uh, when, when I hear that question often, uh, usually comes from people who are struggling with 
if with, whether they're Hebrew, um, Hebrew Israelites in particular. And so I think to, to some extent we can acknowledge that there were black Jews that came over on the transatlantic slave trade. I think what the extremists would say, all people that came across were black Jews, yeah. and that's not the truth. And so I think we can affirm that there were some black Jews who came across uh, the transatlantic slave trade and acknowledge that some black people in America can trace their ancestry back to the Hebrew people um, without affirming at the same time that all. So I think it's a, it's a both and, not, not either or. Okay, uh, well, in 1 Peter 3.15, um, he exhorts us to always be ready to give a reason and defense for the hope that is within us, but to do it with gentleness and kindness. So a lot of times we miss that the latter part of, of that uh, famous sort of verse that's used in, in, in apologetics. And so this next question kind of deals with that, that latter part. This person asks, what does it look like to challenge, what does it look like to challenge our white brothers and sisters in our quest to share a gospel that is not that is not whitewashed. So they're not just asking just for the information part, but like also I think what's the sort of posture that we should take in these uh, conversations? I want to push back against that notion okay, because of what I hear. It may not be what was implied, but what I hear. One of the critiques, of course, that Dr. King always received was being an outside agitator. And one of his most powerful quotes for me was a part of his first book in 1958, Stride Toward Freedom, where he said, true peace is not the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. And what often happens is that when there is tension that arises, the perception is that you're not offering or operating in a godly fashion, right? That if you, if you create tension in the moment, you're not doing what Christ would have you to do. The reality is, is that the call of Christ and the fire of Christ sometimes causes us to enter in with a fire and to create a tension that makes it uncomfortable for you to remain where you are. And here's the reality. Many white Christians, and this is across the traditions, including Dr. King would say, have been more harmful to black people, right, uh, who have not been wearing the hood and uh, the, uh, the, the robe, but who have been that white Christian moderate who has endorsed through their silence the harms that are taking place. And so there are a number of white churchgoers who need the challenge, who need to be made uncomfortable. And you should not feel bad about it. You should not feel as though you are not operating under a spirit of love simply because you challenge somebody to move from where they are to a greater place. And so that's, that's why I push back against conversations because I'm, I'm, I'm particularly tired of black folk being told to make white people comfortable and to create white comfortable spaces for white people because rarely is it the fact that change happens when you're comfortable. I oftentimes get questions from, from, from uh, churches, sometimes white and affluent, and they say, okay, we want to be a more racially equitable space. We want to be a more loving space. Where do we begin? And I usually ask them, how many white Jesuses are in your church? And are you ready now to take those down? And your answer to the question shows your commitment to bringing about the change. I'm, I'm not quite that spiritual. Um, I, that, 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 that speak the truth in love, you know, uh, I ain't there yet. Okay, I'm working on it. Um, I, I, I believe the truth uh, by uh, the philosophy of Malcolm. By any means necessary. And if that means that I'm speaking it in the context of oppression around my feet, oppression in my community, oppression against my kids, I need to speak that truth, and I'm going to love later, 
because I ain't grown to that spiritual verse le level yet. But, but I don't think the truth, I don't think the truth is negotiable. I think we must, and I, and I think that the, the generation that, that you guys are, that are coming along, they're demanding that. They're calling upon us to do that. And I think that the truth uh, of the truth of the twisting of the, 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 the uh, counterfeits, I think those things need to be declared. And I think that to not declare them in the interest of not rocking the boat, making people, you know, that's, that's, uh, I ain't there yet. <laughs> I, 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 I want to I join this competition and I'm going to be even less spiritual. Uh, and, uh, Come on, you man. know, but no, but I actually think this is biblical, but I think like, honestly, maybe an even more militant thing to do uh i agree with everything that's been said but i think it, at some point like um, in, in, an even stronger thing to do is to just sometimes just be done and just walk away i think that uh i absolutely agree that prophetic challenges need to be issued that is deeply christian and the idea that just go along and be nice and don't rock the boat you know when the boat is sinking that that's deeply unbiblical but I also just want to say that I think there comes a time when especially people who are coming and operating out of the margins need to care for themselves and need to take care of themselves. And I just I see black and other people of color like constantly being expected to continue to labor and contend and help white people get it yeah. and like keep on doing it. And it comes at the person of color's expense. It comes at their mental, physical, familial, spiritual health. And I think there needs to come a point where we have to just take care of our own community, take care of our own liberation and the white allies that get it. Uh, I'm not trying to be exclusionary, like the white allies that get it, they will come and partner and support not having to be in charge, not having to be the one that's in the head of things. And that's the real ally that's going to come into the margins. When Jesus, when the rich man couldn't let go of his wealth to follow Jesus and he walked away with his head down, Jesus didn't run after that man. He didn't say, wait, please, I need your funding. Please stay. Let me just tell you another, another way. Let me stay on staff and keep growing more gray hairs, pulling my hair out, trying to get you. He just said, man, that's hard for a rich man in the kingdom of heaven. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. Yes. I want to uh, add, add something to that. You know, one of the things that I think I see often in white spaces is them trying to recruit our best and brightest to talk about everything. They're, they could be experts on New Testament, but they want you to talk about race. They only see us as people that can talk about one aspect. So one of the reasons why this space is so important is because it's to highlight the excellence and brilliance in our community that is not limited to one aspect. And I want to encourage us not to use your best energy to try to change the minds of people who have already proven it's mine not to change and focus not, I mean, everybody's not called to this, but I know I'm called to this, to focus on liberating our people, to make sure our people are educated, to make sure our generation, the generations behind us aren't lost. And I've just seen so many white institutions spend our best and brightest energy, and then they have none for our community. And so I want us to spend our strength to help our people be the best we can be. Amen. Amen. Dr. Bonsu, I'm going to come to you uh, for the start of this next question. What cultural expressions in the black church in America reflect white supremacy? Yeah. I mean, we talked about some of them. I mean, you know, images of white Jesus. I think that uh, Pastor hit on a really good one, too, is that there's a deeply unbiblical way of viewing prophetic engagement that has been imbibed in the black church in many ways and many other Christians of color as well have imbibed a uh, a really like uh, again even in the white community they don't practice it fully I mean they'll say 
be peaceful, be nice, and all that. But when there's a social or political issue that's important to them, you know, they'll throw tea in the Boston Harbor. Like, they'll take up arms. So it's very uh, hypocritical. It's very, like, uh, you know, just kind of temperamental. Uh, when it's, but when it's a communities affecting black or indigenous communities, then it's, well, just, you know, get along and just be patient. But I think that that kind of mentality has been imbibed as well. Um, and then I think another aspect of it is, um, you know, I, I think it goes back to the two things I mentioned, that people in our communities and communities around the world that I see are hungering for, especially those that are Christian or have been touched by white colonial uh, Christendom. Uh, and it's that, you know, a hunger for justice and a Christianity that, that speaks to justice from the authority of the word of God. Because again, justice is not a political or a partisan agenda. It's a biblical agenda. It's a kingdom of God agenda. And then that other piece of cultural identity. I think, again, God intended us for, to be these cultures on purpose. John looked up in Revelation 7 and saw a multitude of all nations. He saw every tribe, nation, and tongue. We will still be black in heaven. You will still be Chinese, Nigerian, Japanese, Mexican, French, whatever. He heard every language. So cultural identity is a part of the creation mandate. He said, he said it's all, he looked at it and said it was good. And he said, fill the earth and cultivate it and be fruitful and multiply. And sometimes we have, a, I think, a bad theology of culture that we think culture is bad uh, or that it, or somehow in heaven we're all going to be like transparent ghosts and we're all going to be the same culture. No, God is eternally diverse. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's three in one, but, he, but the Father and the Son and the Spirit are not exactly the same. You can't have unity without having diversity. God wants unity, but he does not want uniformity. And so what does it mean to truly embrace our African-descended black culture? And I think that that is another thing that we have imbibed is that we see African culture as demonic. We see it as ungodly. We, we can't do that in church. We can't, we can't embrace those things. And so especially those of us in slavery, but even on that those of us that were brought over here in slavery, but even those on the continent as well. There's a demonization of African culture that is completely unbiblical. Now, is there problematic or unbiblical aspects of African culture? Of course there are, but no more than any other culture in the world. And we have no problem putting up Christmas trees and Christmas wreaths, and we say Thor's Day every single week. There's all kinds of European Anglo-Saxon paganism that is completely unchristian that, we've, that we as black people have embraced. We will embrace European paganism paganism, but we won't even embrace our own African roots in any degree whatsoever. And I think that that demonization of African spirituality and culture is an aspect of white supremacy that's been imbibed by many in the black church. Did you say Thor's Day? Thursday, Thor's Day. Okay, wow, I didn't, we getting a master class. I, I didn't even know that. That's a good one. <laughs> I, like, I thought I heard that, but okay. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to say something on that point, yes, though. Yes, please. And, and it's that in reality, there are some black churches that hate black people. And that's something we have to contend with, particularly when we talk about socioeconomics. There's a certain type of black people we like that we want to embrace. Um, we've literally picked up our churches and followed the people we like where they're living now because integration allows us to live in different spaces. And we left our impoverished brothers and sisters where they are, and we don't welcome them. In a very interesting notion of white supremacy, white supremacy enjoys black culture, enjoys being entertained. So we'll listen to hip hop, we'll enjoy the food, we'll go to homecoming, we'll go to the hood for fun, but we will then make a differentiation between what's acceptable in our spaces. We gotta recognize that you know there was the paper bag test in churches as well, that you couldn't be a shade darker uh, than the paper bag to be a part of this black church. And, and so that's a part of our history as well for which we have to contend. Um, and I think that's the very notion of white supremacy is that it ultimately arrives at the point where you begin to hate yourself and begin to try to distance yourself as far away as you can from who God created you to be. It's very hard to say. I think another notion in terms of how black churches function in a way of white supremacy in terms of how we treat women. I think there's a certain violence against women that is wholly white supremacist. 
a lack of honor for women and their gifts, women and girls, and their gifts operating in the fullness of the ministry of the church. I don't see that as a birthright of African or black people. I see that as part of the white patriarchy and how it has manifested and not given honor uh, to women and girls. Yeah, th thank you. And I, I want to stay there for a moment. Those, those are some excellent points. So how then can we change that narrative? How can we change the narrative of the, as you put it, like the violence against um, the, uh, um, just not seeing women as God created them in all of their beauty and magnificence? How can we change that narrative, like you said, against those in the black community who uh, may be put on a lower pedestal or may, maybe, like you said, it's someone in here who may uh, see themselves in a certain light and then view others in a, a lower light. How can we change that narrative? What can we do? Sure, I think, I think several things are important. One, I think we have to move away from the claim that all churches where black people are present are black churches. There are some spaces filled with black people but they're not black church. I, I see a black church as a space committed to black liberation. And if it's not committed to black liberation, it doesn't fall within the strain in my understanding of historic black church. So first we gotta differentiate that. There are some black churches that are white assimilated in their theology and in their practice. And because of that will be harmful to black presence. Another thing to recognize, and I see this motif happening in Scripture, is that when Joshua and the people crossed the river and they told the priests to stand in the middle of the water, it was so that they could stay there till everyone made it safely across. And when I look at the American Civil Rights Movement and what has happened in the years subsequent, what I find is that as soon as the people of means and ability made it across, we vacated the river and left everyone else to drown. We didn't bring everybody over with us. And for that, we have to repent, right? And so I, I think that's an opportunity to go back and to reclaim and to make these new connections with our indigenous locations and begin to celebrate the beauty and presence of God that is there. Finally, here's a reality. Uh, most, a good number, let me not say most, I don't want to speak in generalized senses, but I, I think if we do an interrogation of many of our congregations, we'll see that self-hatred still remains. Um, maybe not as pronounced as it was in previous generations, but we still have, in particular, black women who contend with this notion of good hair or bad hair, or their beauty in terms of Eurocentric forms, which I find particularly troubling when you understand uh, that uh, there was so much rape during the transatlantic slave trade in the days of slavery that it impacted the genetics of Americans, that there's an overrepresentation of white European blood in black people because our black sisters were raped and harmed with such frequency. And so I can't understand how we have a, 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 a culture that has impacted our DNA, and yet black women are supposed to be undesirable in their natural form. And we have to take some responsibility of that as well in terms of how that is perpetuated in certain aspects of hip hop, and how we continue to degradate and tear down our beautiful black women and our girls. And there's no way that a people can be strong a house divided amongst itself cannot stand, and we tear down black women. Here's the final thing I'll say. You didn't ask the question, but this is important. <laughs> if it weren't for the women, where would we be? You know, when we talk about Montgomery, say the Montgomery bus boycotts, we get real excited about Dr. King and them leading the movement, and we somehow forget those black women and girls who stayed up all night long running the pamphlets to keep people off the bus. Black women are still the strength of movement, and yet we restrict them in their leadership in God's church. I don't see that as a African birthright. I see that as a part of white supremacy, and we should reject and repent for if, that. 
if I could push back just a little bit, though, uh, I agree with everything that you're saying, uh, you know, in terms of like patriarchy, colorism, classism being problems that we absolutely have to attend to in the black church and the black community. Um, and that were certainly received and like, uh, and then have been re-performed from white supremacy in real specific ways. But I'm just, just I just want to throw in there though, uh, as a scholar of like ancient and medieval African history that those those evils were certainly there though, even before white folks showed up on the continent. That I mean, you know, Tertullian, the first African theologian, he called women the devil's gateway. Uh, and you know, you have actually, you know, paintings of Nubia and Ethiopia pre-colonialism that are showing like darker skin uh, Africans and lighter skin, like it, when the, in these same kind of disparaging ways. And and so, and then you had classism as well. And so, uh, and I, I don't I don't point that out either, just to like be overly like nuanced about it. But I think it actually can help us to realize that like um, that these things have been practiced and exported through the vehicle of white supremacy and colonialism at a greater extent that human history has ever seen but at the end of the day all of us as people black white yellow brown red we all have these tendencies towards colorism towards classism towards pa male patriarchy and the oppression of women and we don't necessarily need white supremacy to 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 fall into those sins and we and i'm just saying historically that we didn't and that can i think maybe help us just remember that uh that we have autonomy and that we have the uh also the ability to make these choices to fight these evils even in our own context I think um, I, I want to find a middle ground I, um, I I made a commitment and, and I think many in my generation um, some have learned some are still trying to learn to stand in the tension between my blackness and my bibliocentricity Th that I refuse to have to make a choice between being black and being Bible. And that I have in many cases, uh, too many cases, uh, chosen the invitation to come into a room and the affirmation of the supremacists, um, the, um, uh, the validation um, that in order to come in that room, I need to leave some of my chocolate outside. I'm like Diana Ross, I'm coming out. <laughs> and we can't stay there. We, we cannot be, it's like Paul and, and his Judaism, you know. Uh, we, we cannot be forced be, because of this supremacy uh, to have to drop one and, and pick up the other one. Uh, I, I, I won't lay down one for the other. I'll be black and Jesus. And I think it's important to also recognize that Africa was not monotheistic or, or was not uh, um, mono in terms of one form. And there were African cultures where the woman was wholly revered and celebrated and was central and were the warriors, right? And so we, we have to acknowledge that as a prevailing notion of Africa as well. And I think the perpetuation of the uh, restriction of black women is in, in this country, it's more tied to white supremacy than any African notions, holistic African notions of women. All right, thank you. Um, and we have about five minutes left, uh, so I wanna give everybody a good amount of chance to answer this, what will probably be the final question. We've talked a lot about racial and ethnic pain um, that's associated with Christianity and in particular Christians. We talked about the four girls who were bond. We have literal representations of up here that you uh, brought up here, Dr. Waters, of the racial pain that we've uh, experienced, our, our ancestors have experienced. And so when we think about all this racial pain and the things that have contributed to this question of is Christianity the white man's religion, why in the world is the gospel actually good news? It was a part of the conversation earlier, which I really appreciate. I believe it's amongst the biblical scholars uh, concerning Greek. You know, there was an Attic Greek, the Greek of the aristocracy, but there was also Kone Greek, the Greek of the marketplace. I always find it very inspiring uh, that the Greek of scripture is basically the Greek of the streets. So Greek of the people, right? To reach those who were oppressed. That's good news. The euangelion is good news. It's written in a tongue made accessible 
to the people of the streets. Uh, it is a canon, it is a scripture that in the right hands, with the right spirit, has led to movement and to liberation. And that's good news. Uh, it has inspired, it continues to unlift, and it is not the property of white people. It's not even the property of black people. It is the property of God given to God's people for the liberation of our people all over the world. I see good news when I see a leper healed. When I see Jesus moving about, I see Jesus advocating for free health care for all. He has free health care for all in the hem of his garment to make people whole. I see him challenging economic systems, going into the temple uh, where they were created economic system uh, that created greater debt and poverty for the impoverished, and he turns over the table. I see that's good news. I see him welcoming women in in places where they would have been pushed away. When they bring a woman to stone her because she was caught in adultery, he asks, uh, who amongst you uh, is without sin? Cast the first stone. But in really, he's interrogating, I think, the issue that you brought the woman, but somehow you didn't bring the man. There's something wrong with this system, and I stand against it. Over and over again throughout the Gospels, we see good news. And we see an invitation to draw near to this Christ who said in his own words, in his inaugural statement, right, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because it's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to declare the year of the Lord's favor, the only time in the New Testament where jubilee is presented, where we're having these debates about student loan cancellation. Uh, I think Jesus would be in for it because he was for debt cancellation through jubilee. Over and over again in the Gospels, I see a God committed to our liberation, so much so that he's willing to die for it. That's good news. And I think that is the opportunity to uplift, even in the midst uh, of the racial horrors. And, and, and finally, if I, if I can say this, because as someone who has, I've led civil rights pilgrimages for the last 20 years. I've taken people uh, to the waters of Glendora, Mississippi, where both Emmett Till's body was dropped in and where it was recovered from. Sarah Collins Rudolph, the fifth of those little girls who was bombed. Her, her, her sister died. She lost an eye in that bombing. I've sat in the room to investigate the scar tissue that is still around her eyes. I've been in the homes of freedom riders who were beaten within an inch of their lives. I've sat down with Andrew Young. I've sat down with the late John Lewis. I've had conversation with them. And to a person, when you ask them what enabled you to endure, to keep on showing up, to keep on fighting, it was a hope in this Christ to bring about their liberation. That is good news. And if it was strong enough to sustain our ancestors under the scorching sun of slavery, if it was strong enough to hold them facing dogs and cattle prods and hoses, then certainly it's strong enough to help us in this day as we continue to seek our liberty. So. When I think about the good news of Jesus, I often use this illustration when it comes to apologetics, but I think it's pressing here. Uh, when you get on an airplane, uh, if the pilot got on the plane and said, "Do you want? Are we flying? Do you want to fly with the left wing or the right?" Most of us would exit the plane <laughs> because we understand that unless we have two wings, we're not going anywhere. And what I love about the good news of Jesus is it has two wings. That it not only is a liberation, good news for the poor, but it has a liberation for a greater oppressor, which is sin, that held my soul. And the blood of Jesus frees me from the sin of slavery, but also the slavery of sin. And that's why it's good news. It's not good news if we just have one wing. And I think that's the divide in the church. We pick one wing or the other, and we wonder why our gospel has no power. And I think 
a true liberation of Jesus is understanding that yes, he wants me free from white supremacy and that oppression, but he also wants me free from the sin sick soul that I have. And that's what the good news of Jesus is. And that's why I believe in Jesus because there is no other liberator that can free me from both. We're, we're, all, we're almost out of time, but the boss is on the stage, so I think we're okay. <laughs> and this is an important question that I want to give, I want to let everybody have time, you know, to breathe. So Dr. Bantu, and then we'll, we'll come to you for the last one. Yeah, I just uh, want to say amen to both of us said, especially from uh, Lisa just then. And, um, and uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, again, just, you know, uh, you know, we asked, the, the question was framed about in light of all of the white supremacist Christendom, right? That I think this, I, I could respond to that part and tie it into another question earlier of how we engage, you know, white supremacy now is I think that a, a big part of what we need to do to, to earn the credibility uh, that I, I absolutely think we need to do as as black Christians and, and, and Christians in general is to, when we're looking at people who are, are hesitant with Christianity uh, for really valid reasons in many ways. I think that we need to earn their credibility. And one of the ways we do that is that we unapologetically and unashamedly and unequivocally denounce white supremacist Christendom and not do it with like kind of a caveat or like a disclaimer, you know, but like, no, like, you know, uh, you know, like my brother was just talking about what brought people, our ancestors through slavery was Jesus. But I love their nuance that they were able to have in that when they were getting a polluted body. Bible. I mean, again, this, this is literally like distorting the word of God. <laughs> I mean, what more evidence do we need to know that this is this expression of so-called Christianity is heresy. It's not Christianity at all. And we have to just denounce that in order to win credibility with those who've been marginalized. But the, our ancestors understood that. Frederick Douglass said between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of this land, I recognize the widest possible difference. Harriet Jacobs talked about old Satan's churches down here below, but up to God's heavenly church, I hope to go. And so they didn't let the, the white supremacist Christendom ruined Jesus for them. And yet, and also understand the need for uh, social salvation as well as spiritual salvation, that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. And that was something that even in our traditional African religious practices, we needed to hear. And that's kind of why I was trying to make the point earlier about even apart from white supremacy, we... In, on the continent, committed sinful acts against women uh, uh, based on complexion, uh, based on economics, and all of us need to be saved. And, and, but the last thing I would say is that, um, especially when we look at, as I mentioned earlier, about what people are clearly hungering for, for their blackness to be affirmed, for justice and the cause of justice to be affirmed and, str and strove for by the church. Not only is the gospel good news, it is the only good news that Jesus is the only way. God made black people. And so a lot of times people are struggling with this whole question of this panel. Is Christianity white man's religion? Another way of framing that is, uh, as Bishop was saying, well, can I be black and be a Christian at the same time? That's not a question that God ever even wanted us to have to even answer. We should not even have to answer that question. But we have to answer it. That's why we're doing this. But we shouldn't have to. I feel that God weeps when we even have to answer that question because God made black in his image. I tell people who are non-Christians in the black community who are a little bit, you know, questionable about Christianity, I say, if you want to really be, if you love being black, you, you, you know, you, you love being black and you love your African ancestry, then be a Christian. <laughs> because not only does being a Christian not make you less black, it's the only way to be fully black. Because all of us are born in need of regeneration and our ethnic, cultural, racial identity is a part of our imago day of our being made in the image of God. So the bisrot, the good news is that only through faith in Christ can you come into a fullness, can you return to a fullness of yourself. And again, as I mentioned in Revelation, we will still be black and everyone will still be who they are in God's image. And the only way to get to the fullness of African identity of blackness is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. who made blackness in his image. And that is good news, especially for people who are hungering to have their blackness honored and dignified. Then come to the Jesus who made it in the first place. Amen. Amen. And I think it's fitting that we give the final word to the esteemed Bishop Ulmer. Amen.
good? Okay. All right. <laughs> he was serious. He was serious. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, for this, just uh, uh, all these great answers to these important questions. So thank you so much. Yeah.